back a year ago. Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. Very excited to be joined today by Professor Max Nelson. Max is a professor in the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at the University of Windsor. His major focus in his teaching and research include Roman civilization, Roman history and society, Latin, the classical tradition, leisure and pleasure in the ancient world, the ancient world on the screen, and magic in the ancient world. Max's research and writings often blend aspects of ancient social history, particularly the history of pleasure. This often includes the consumption of alcohol. Max is the author of The Barbarian's Beverage, A History of Beer in Ancient Europe. Very excited to speak to Max and learn more about beer and its profound global history. So Max, welcome to the Beer Bound, <laughs> welcome to the Beer Bound podcast. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course. Well, I gave a little introduction, Max, but maybe could you go a little bit further into depth on who you are, your academic focus, your academic background? The floor is yours. Yeah, well, I'm from Windsor. I uh, went to the University of Windsor, did my BA there. Um, I did an MA at the University of Ottawa, PhD at UBC in Vancouver, and I've Return to Windsor. I teach at the University of Windsor uh, since 2001. In terms of beer, I have to say I've enjoyed beer for a long time. <laughs> I was introduced to good beer when I was young. Uh, my mother was, in fact, born in Belgium, the land of great beers. No way. Where in Belgium? Um, she was born just outside of Brussels. So your go a little bit further, Max. Your interest in beer is that something? you've had since you were a, a young man? Is it more of a, a focus after you started your academic career? What's the story? Well, I've always enjoyed beer. And when it came to looking for a topic for my PhD dissertation, uh, I decided I might as well do something I enjoy. I've heard stories of people stuck trying to finish their PhDs with projects they don't like. I figured if it was uh, on beer, um, I would finish it um, you know, and enjoy uh, doing it. So uh, no one had ever collected uh, or analyzed all the ancient references to beer in Greek and Roman sources. Um, there had been a lot of work on beer um, references in other places, right, like Mesopotamia and Egypt. Uh, but it was left to me to do that, discuss uh, beer in ancient Europe. So what is ancient Europe? Give us a time frame. Well, um, when we're talking about the ancient and Greek and Roman sources, we're talking about roughly from 500 BC to 500 AD or so. So about a thousand years of history. Um, obviously, um, there was beer before it was written about. And uh, so we have to um, supplement what we find in uh, the written evidence with archaeological evidence. And uh, although that's not my specialty, there has been uh, a lot of work on that so-called archaeochemistry. So people who uh, have analyzed ancient pottery, vessels in which alcohol would have been fermented, stored, um, and obviously uh, drunk from, right? And uh, they have analyzed them and discovered the oldest remains of beer and so forth. So where, Max, did beer come from, do you think, in its origins? So I know I've done a bit of research on this, and it seems like we're not 100% sure exactly the, the original location. I know that most sources state back to ancient Mesopotamia, but I also know that some sources say that ancient China takes takes the takes the trophy as the true original beer maker. Can you give us your sense and from your expertise, where does beer actually come from in in our entire species? 
So uh, to put it simply, beer probably did not come from one place, right? Uh, but this is a complicated issue. I think first what we might want to do is define what beer is, right? And I know you've talked about that in other episodes, mm -hmm. uh, but um, beer basically is alcohol made from cereals, uh, but cereals themselves don't have enough sugar really to ferment very well. And uh, to put it very simply, um, fermentation is the process whereby sugars, right, are transformed in water by yeast into alcohol and carbonation. Uh, and so uh, obviously there are all kinds of sugars occurring naturally um, all over the place. And uh, so fermentation occurs naturally, right? Um, and so different uh, types of fruits that have sugar in them um, and often have yeast on their surfaces and so on, when uh, kind of crushed will naturally ferment. And probably the earliest alcohol was made this way, right? So just naturally and was experienced not just by early humans, but by animals as well. The problem with beer is that uh, beer is not so easily made, right? If you want to make a wine, um, you can basically just crush some grapes and leave them out um, and you'll have some wine, right? Because the grapes have the water, the sugar, and often um, there's natural yeast too, right there. With cereal, you need to convert um, the starches in the cereal to make sugar. And so you have this step basically the step of malting or germination, uh, which can be done by um, allowing the cereal to germinate, right, to grow, and then cut that off. And um, basically, again, I'm putting it simply, it'll turn the starches into sugars, and then you can ferment the sugars, mainly maltose, in water. So all that said, um, beer wouldn't be found naturally or uh, wouldn't have been um, commonly uh, just created spontaneously like wine might have been, right, or other fruit alcohols. Uh, all that said, it, um, it could have started in various places, right? We have no way of knowing today, and I don't think we can ever know who made the first beer, right? Um, it was probably made in various places, and this would have been long before cereals were actually cultivated. So um, we're talking about using wild cereals and through experimentation by allowing cereals to germinate, possibly also chewing cereals, right, through the process of using the enzymes in the saliva that also is a way of malting cereals. Right. And then leaving out the uh, what you have uh, you'd get beer. But this probably, this process was probably replicated thousands of times in various places by various Neolithic ancestors, right? Is it fair to say, like, we, how old is our species, Max? Maybe 120,000 years old, something like that? Um, good question. That's way <laughs> earlier than what I usually deal with. But yeah. Something like that. Right. <laughs> So it's interesting to say we don't really know, right? Because like, because written documentation doesn't go back anywhere near that period. So it is possible. I mean, maybe it's not possible, but that some form of alcoholic consumption, because you mentioned there are some animals in various locations, I think both in Africa and I think in South America, there are several animals that do enjoy fermented fruits. So it's possible to say maybe that that we've been enjoying some sort of fermentation. You you mentioned obviously beer is a little bit more complex. You can't really ferment cereal grain just simply from its natural source. You have to trick it into germination, into creating malt to get those starches ready for alcohol. But do you think like it like alcohol, it is just so natural, right? The process of fermentation, we've probably been consuming some form of alcohol probably for I don't know our entire existence would that be fair to say yeah pretty much right 
And again, before us, animals were doing it. And there have been plenty of studies showing how animals seek out alcohol, again, naturally fermented alcohol. Um, and as you pointed out, the problem is we don't have writing from this period. We're talking about a period long before writing. And the other issue, like I said before, uh, for example, when it comes to ancient Europe, uh, I've dealt mainly with the written evidence, but we can supplement that with older archeological evidence. The problem, the time period that we're talking about, the Neolithic time period, and the kind of thing we're talking about, you know, people making their own beer, there'd be no archeological record of that, right? What are you looking for? This is a period before pottery was even made. Um, so it's different when you actually uh, start finding pottery, right? Um, after around 10,000 BC. Uh, and then um, you can analyze the pottery for certain residue in it, right? Such as when it comes to beer, uh, one of the telltale signs is calcium oxalate or beer stone, which can harden on the surface of a pot. And similarly for uh, wine and other kind of alcoholic beverages, there are certain telltale markers. So uh, when it comes to the origins, I don't think they're recoverable, right? We can't tell um, by written evidence or archaeological evidence where the roots of beer drinking are from. And we're talking about a period, you know, again, before agriculture and before pottery making and so on. And even when we come to the point of agriculture, the old theory was that um, agriculture began in Mesopotamia and kind of spread from there. Um, but Scholars tend to believe there were various hearths of agriculture. Um, so one was in the Americas, and um, there were hearths in Mesopotamia, but also in China and so on. So even at the stage when people started to purposely grow their own food and their own cereal, right, to make beer from or bread from, um, that wasn't just one place, right? So again, beer was probably found in discovered in all sorts of places and made in all, all sorts of places uh, early on. Very fascinating. So it we do know, I don't know this, this is a question. We do know that beer in Europe, in a European sense, is quite a newer, beer is a lot newer to the European continent in, in comparison to say, what we identify now as the Middle East or North Africa. Is that, is that, do we know that? Yes, right. So when it comes to the uh, earliest finds of beer, right, again, by, mm -hmm. by analyzing pots for beer stone and so on, um, there's no find before about 3000 BC. And that is of containers that just point to beer. Uh, when it comes to Europe, it's around that time or a little later. Uh, but beer, as we think of it today, is not simply fermented maltose and water, right, as I defined it. Right. When we think of beer today, we think of um, especially hops, um, the use of hops in beer as a way of balancing out the sweetness of the malt. So um, obviously the vast majority of beers today use hops, even those that don't necessarily have a very hop forward flavor, right? And um, as far as we know, the use of hops in beer is a purely European um, innovation. Um, again, we rely on archeology span and it wasn't that long ago that archeologists discovered in a Celtic grave in what is now Northern Italy, the earliest um, known combination of hops with cereal in a container, which would point to beer, right? And that's dated to about the sixth century BC. So people were fermenting, you know, cereals for a long time, um, but they were adding various herbs 
um, to it, right? Um, and also honey and so on. Uh, until I suppose at some point, some people thought that hops worked really well with beer, right? So in that way, um, the beer we're used to today, right, pretty much spread throughout the world from Europe. And it's very hard to find other styles, although there are some other styles of beer without hops, right, in Africa and other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that surprises me. So there was, or rather there is evidence of the use of hops even in, did you say five, 500 BC? What, what you yeah, know? the sixth century BC. So we're sixth talking century. about uh, 2,500 years ago. And yeah. I, I know the knowledge of this is, um, you know, not widespread. When, when people think of hopped um, beer, um, they think of it as a medieval invention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's when we have the first written evidence for it, mm -hmm. right? In, um, where but, would that, like in modern day Germany, I think? Is that right? Yeah, what is now Germany, that's mm -hmm. right. And uh, other, roughly what is now Northern France, Belgium, Germany, um, our earliest written sources on hops uh, come from the early Middle Ages, roughly the sixth century on. And uh, there are accounts of hops being used in the making of beer in monasteries, in various monasteries. Um, but uh, archaeological evidence pushes that back a good thousand years, right? Um, and again, I'm just talking about one find in one grave. Um, so this might be, you know, just kind of an accident that someone made some hoppy beer, right, at one point. But I think we could argue that hopped beer was a Celtic invention that was later taken up by the Germanic people who settled in Europe, right? And uh, it became common during the early Middle Ages and up to today. Right, and it's hard to kind of explain like who, who the Celts were, because I know they encompass quite a large swath of territory in Europe at one point, but can you kind of identify who, if, if you're attributing that cultural piece to the Celts, like who, who were the Celts? Right, and um, there is some controversy about, about this, right? Who exactly were the Celts and so on. Mm -hmm. um, the way I use the term Celtic and most scholars as well as using the word German is by identifying uh, peoples according to the languages they spoke, right? So um, we can identify um, groups of Celtic speaking people who spread throughout Europe um, from about 1000 BC on. Um, they were in what is now Austria, Germany, Belgium, France, down into Spain, Portugal. They were even in Turkey, in Galatia. Obviously, they went to England and Ireland and so on. So they spread um, all over the place, right? Um, they were eventually conquered by the Romans, right? And then eventually the Roman Empire in the West fell to the Germanic tribes. Um, so that's the kind of background um, for, you know, the beer drinking at um, this period. Mm -hmm. And in terms, obviously, most people are pretty familiar with the Roman Empire. Did I know that we're, we're glossing over hundreds, if not thousands of years in quick little paragraphs, but can you give us a very brief sense of what the impact was from the Romans in terms of beer creation, the spreading of beer across Europe? Right, and um, what I talk about in my book, right, The Barbarian's Beverage, which again was based on my PhD in which I collected the ancient Greek and Roman evidence, is that What's strange is that um, as far as we know, uh, in the ancient world, those people who had cereal um, would ferment it, right? And uh, make beer from it. So these um, people included the Celtic peoples in Europe, right? In Africa, we're talking about the civilization in Egypt, peoples who were in Mesopotamia, like the Sumerians and others. All these people had um, easy access to uh, cereal, 
and would make beer from it. What's a bit of an enigma is that we don't find beer among um, the classical Greeks, right, who considered it a foreign beverage, even though they had a lot of cereal and could have obviously made beer. And so that's the main puzzle behind my book, why did ancient Greeks not have beer? Um, who knows exactly how it started, but over time, they came to think of it as a barbarian beverage, right? Hence the name of my book. That is a beverage of outsiders, of mm -hmm. uh, uncivilized people like the Celts. Um, they thought of it uh, strangely as an unmanly beverage. So today we tend to think of it the other way around as a highly manly beverage. Uh, but they contrasted it with wine. So the Greeks thought wine was warming and manly and uh, was good for the body, but they felt that beer was womanish, right? That was bad for the body, that it was linked with water rather than fire. So they had all these kind of pseudoscientific ideas about beer. And the problem is they didn't understand what we understand. It, and that is that beer and wine are both fundamentally alcohol, right? Um, they're the same substance. Um, for, for Greeks and later Romans, they thought that um, beer was a completely different type of substance than wine, that it was made from rotted cereals, right? Uh, whereas wine, they connected more with the gods and thought of it as kind of spontaneously created. They didn't understand anything about fermentation or that, again, both were fundamentally alcohol. Now, I know you asked me about the Romans and um, similarly, the Romans uh, in Italy thought of beer as a foreign beverage, right? We don't have evidence for um, beer drinking in ancient Italy itself, but of course, over time, the Romans spread uh, and conquered um, various areas, right? They ended up conquering Greece, but also conquering Celtic territories and other territories. And so the Romans absorbed various beer drinkers within their empire. Uh, and so by the third century AD, right, um, you could be a Roman citizen and live in Britain or Egypt, right, or what is now Turkey or France. Um, and so there were Roman uh, beer drinkers, right, um, by that time. Because the territory was just, you just, it just became such a, <laughs> a massive empire, right? You right. comparing Romans in Britain at the time to, to conquered Egypt. I mean, those people would probably be, I mean, there are Roman subjects, but they would be quite different culturally for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned this too, and I'm always, I'm, I'm maybe skipping ahead a little bit in history and it's not so ancient, but maybe it is. And maybe you can shine a light on this a little bit. The, you mentioned monasteries. So what we maybe think today as like, as Trappist beers, getting their origins from, from monasteries all across Europe. Can you, can you touch on that a little bit? Why like, when did this start, this phenomenon? Are, are you familiar with this? Like I said, in my very ignorant um, lens on this is, is that, that the creation of, of beer by, um, by monks and monasteries, like that's, that's not such an old phenomenon. Maybe it goes back 1,000, 1,200 years, something like that, or does it go back substantially further? It goes back further. Yeah, um, the the first monks were in Egypt, right? Um, so in Egypt, you had Christians um, in the second and third century. So these are very early Christians who um, started to uh, live together communally, right? And so our first monasteries are found there. And uh, while some early monks were against any drinking of alcohol, right? And so they abstained completely. Some of them drank only water. Um, there were some that promoted beer drinking. And of course, in Egypt, beer drinking was common, as was, in fact, wine drinking as well. Uh, and so our first evidence for monks drinking beer is, in fact, in ancient Egypt, 
Um, we have written evidence in Coptic texts, for instance, that mention beer drinking monks. However, um, my sense is that the, uh, the making of beer in European monasteries is a separate tradition. In other words, even though the idea of the monastic community uh, came from Egypt into Europe, um, the actual making of beer by monks, uh, uh, which was done in Egypt, didn't necessarily influence the European monks directly, right? Uh, it, uh, European monks tended to drink wine. Uh, however, um, in the sixth century, Benedict of Nursia, um, who was uh, an important abbot in Italy, um, created his uh, rule for his own monastery, um, which would be the basis of uh, the Benedictine order, right? And his rule was that um, monks could be allowed to have a certain amount of beer uh, per day, right? Um, and this rule has had an enormous influence. The Trappists, uh, although they come much later, um, are uh, Benedictines, right? Um, and there are other uh, types of uh, Benedictines who still make beer today, right? So this goes back to uh, a medieval European tradition. And arguably, um, the monks, as I said before, um, got the idea of making hopped beer specifically uh, from uh, the native Celtic peoples um, in ancient Europe. Uh, but by the High Middle Ages, there was um, a common rule that um, monks could drink wine, and if wine wasn't available where they were, they were allowed to have a double share of beer, um, which tends to show us that wine was twice as strong as beer was at the time, which is roughly what it is um, today. Um, the uh, other rule, though, was that monks were never supposed to get drunk, right? So uh, the, the beer that they had or the wine um, was drunk in moderation, the wine often cut with water. And even today, Trappist monks um, usually don't drink the product that they make, right? As you know, some of the Trappist beers are really high in alcohol, 9% uh, or more. Um, for example, the monks of Shime have their own black label Shime, not the red, white, or blue that you find sold, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the black label is, is for the monks, and it's about a 3-4% uh, beer. <laughs> Keep them away from the hard stuff. Yeah. Right. And, but, and why... Why would these monks be creating beer in the first place? Is it was it basically a form of like a little bit of a an income source for them? Like they sold most of it. Is that sort of how they were able to to live out their ways just by selling a little bit of the beer that they created? Is, was that the basis for it? Um, that was part of it eventually, right? Um, it it started um, through an idea of self sufficiency. So the earliest monks in Egypt uh, formed their own totally isolated communities in which um, they did everything for themselves, right? That was the idea. And in fact, something most people don't really know is that the earliest monks were influenced by Ro the Roman army, um, interestingly enough, right? Um, the earliest monastic rule that we have by the monk Pacomius um, from Egypt, um, he himself was a Roman soldier. And um, he, he took the ideas of, for example, having a uniform and having different ranks, right, the abbot and so on, uh, from the Roman military, it seems. Um, and also the idea of self-sufficiency, right? Um, the Roman army went on campaign, had to be able to feed its own soldiers and so on. So the earliest monks did everything for themselves. They had their own gardens, grew their own food, made their own drink, and so on. Um, that is, those who 
um, didn't just drink water, right? Um, and this idea continued into the Middle Ages with Benedict of Nursia. His whole rule stresses the importance of monks being totally self-sufficient. So this is one reason why monks made their own beverages, right? But they also had wine and beer available for guests, which was very important um, to have it on hand. Um, obviously, wine was made for sacramental reasons, right? It was used in communion. Um, but as you say, they all do, also did sell it. So it was a way of making income for the monastic community. Uh, and they would sell other things, right, like cheese and other products. And of course, monasteries still do that today, like the Trappist ones in Belgium and other places, um, as a way of making money for their community. Yeah, of course. Well, you also talk a little bit about, um, in your book, The Barbarian's Beverage, A History of Beer in Ancient Europe, you, you devote a chapter sort of after after talking about the Roman Empire, you talk about Germanic Europe and the great beer revival. What, I, to be honest, I didn't read that whole chapter, but what, 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 is, that, what is that time period and, and what exactly, can you tell us a little bit about the Germanic, um, Germanic Europe and, and what exactly they did in, in terms of their contribution to, to the revitalization of beer or the the renaissance maybe of, of beer in Europe? Right, yeah. Um, well, um, we can go through a number of stages of what happened in ancient Europe, right? Uh, very early on, um, people were fermenting basically whatever they had available, right? So they had cereals, they would make beer, they had fruits, they would make wine, um, they had honey, they would make mead, but they also would combine all those things. and. Earlier, you mentioned, you know, China is a possible um, place where, uh, from, from where beer originated. Um, our earliest evidence for alcohol comes from China. Um, it dates to about 7,000 BC. And there we find a mixture of various fermentables, right? Fruit, rice, and honey all together, basically making it a wine, beer, mead. And um, as far as we can tell, that was the tradition also in ancient Europe. We don't have remains that go back to 7,000 BC, but when we do have remains going back to about 3,000, 2,000 BC, we often find that people are mixing various things together. Basically, whatever was available, right? Um, grains they had available, barley, wheat, whatever, the fruits they had available, cranberries or other berries they would throw in if they had honey. And all these would be fermented together in a kind of mixed beverage that's neither wine nor beer nor mead, but all uh, together, right? Over time, we start seeing people just making beer, um, although with additives, like I said, like hops or other herbs, like sweet gale, or sometimes still adding honey in it. Um, but what happened is when the Romans spread throughout Europe, and as I said, they started to encompass um, beer drinkers within their empire, um, the Romans brought wine wherever they went, and wine came to dominate throughout Europe. So there were beer drinkers. There continued to be in the north and in Egypt and other places. But wine came to dominate because... Um, it was considered um, the beverage of the elite, right? The ruling Romans would drink wine normally and not beer. Um, and so uh, wine kind of overtook everything, even among the Celtic peoples, whom I said, you know, made uh, a lot of beer and probably were the first to add hops to beer as far as we know. Um, they started to embrace wine as a higher class beverage. So our notion today of wine as an upper class beverage and beer as a lower class beverage, I think we can track back to um, Roman times. And of course, there are reasons why wine should be more expensive than beer, right? It takes a lot longer to make uh, good wine, right, uh, to 
cultivate the grapes and to age the wine. Um, but um, when you look at other societies outside of Europe, beer and wine were both considered elite beverages. So for example, the pharaohs in ancient Egypt drank beer and wine pretty much indiscriminately as far as we know, right? Interesting. Um, but when we come to Roman Europe, uh, wine comes to dominate and the Celtic people um, continue to drink beer, but consider it a lower class beverage. Um, and we have what I call a hierarchy of beverages, right? Where you have barley beer kind of at the bottom, I guess the very bottom would be water. Um, and then you have um, fancier honey beer at, uh, that's higher up. Um, and then uh, some fermented fruits like fermented pears or apples, uh, so peris or ciders. Uh, and then wine uh, is at the top, right? So um, the Celtic people are still drinking beer, but they have an idea of, you know, classy beverages versus non-classy beverages. So all this leading to what you actually asked me, what about the great German beer revival? Um, the Western Roman Empire fell in the fifth century um, AD to various Germanic tribes that invaded and took over and settled. Uh, and so, for example, the Franks settled in what is now France, right, giving it its name, and various other um, groups like the Anglo-Saxons in England and so forth. And these Germanic people brought their own tradition of beer drinking um, in which they considered beer um, a manly beverage, the way we think of it today, usually, right? And uh, one that you could proudly um, uh, drink perhaps alongside wine, right? Although to some extent, wine obviously continued to be thought of as the elite alcohol, right, in Europe. Yeah, that's really interesting. It does make sense the way you put it because the the process of making good wine does take a lot longer and, and beer has a shorter, much shorter time frame in terms of the creation of it. And then it has a short shelf life as well. Beer doesn't really last that long, certainly when you compare it to wine. So that does make sense in terms of both in the past as well as contemporarily speaking just sort of why these different types of alcohol would be perceived as maybe more more chic more upper class and and some being more um for the for the the simple folks of in the lower class and i think it's really interesting too the way you you've it depends on the culture right and it depends on sort of beer just sort of goes up and down in, in terms of different locations and different time periods um, in relation to how it was viewed in society. It's funny now, I don't think, I don't think there's anywhere on the planet that really views beer as the most sophisticated beverage. It really sort of now is a global staple of, of, of a, ba a basic working class person's drink. Certainly when you're looking at it like macro beer, but then we do now have an interesting sort of renaissance of, of craft beer, of course, in the last few decades that really is shifting the identity of, of craft beer or of beer in general. And certainly in Western countries like the United States and Canada and Great Britain. So I, I just think that's interesting throughout all of beer's history. It's always kind of going up and down depending on where you are of, of what beer where beer sits in terms of its social standing. I find that pretty interesting. Yeah, and as you point out, it's, it's cultural, culturally specific, right? So it changes from culture to culture. But arguably, I think the Greeks and Romans in Europe, um, because they weren't beer drinkers, right? Um, at least not you know, in mainland Greece and in Italy itself, and thought of it as a barbaric and lower class beverage, that idea has still kind of resonated today. As I said, 
the Egyptian idea of, you know, pharaohs sipping their beer, and the same thing is true of the kings in Sumer and in Mesopotamia, right? They drank beer. That idea of beer as a royal beverage for the highest, right, has kind of disappeared. And we've kind of embraced the, the wine lover's idea of beer as mm -hmm. kind of secondary to wine. <laughs> now, um, and you, you, you said this too, it makes sense that wine, you know, is more expensive than beer, of course, again, there, long, there's a longer process, it's more difficult to make. But I think what's interesting is the proportionality of it, right? That, uh, of course, wine should cost more than beer, but should it cost, you know, 10,000 times more mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, that we find with the fanciest wine. So um, the proportion is kind of out of whack, I think, right? Um, people will pay or will be willing to pay a lot more for a fancy wine than a fancy beer. Things have shifted, right? You do find bottles of beer sometimes for hundreds of dollars, but that's extremely rare mm -hmm. compared to, you know, bottles of wine for thousands of dollars. Yeah, it's it's not really even the same market, really. It's like, right. a, yeah, a bottle of beer that's a hundred dollars that would would have some sort of special feature in in it, probably that. I know actually there's a brewery in Northern Ontario, actually, that they, they send their beer to the bottom of a frozen lake to let it ferment over the winter time. And I think they sell that bottle for 80 bucks or something, but it's more of a gimmick. You know, I don't, I don't think the right. fermentation process is any better or it creates a better beer necessarily. It's it just, or the kind of gimmicky beers that Samuel yeah. Adams and others have made that have an enormous, um, you know, uh, alcohol strength mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, they sell those for uh, an enormous amount. Yeah. Right. So Max afterwards, I know this is maybe a little too contemporary, a little too modern history, but we really, maybe in the last few hundred years, beer has, I think become like the fourth, the fourth most consumed beverage on the planet. I think maybe after water, tea and coffee, I think. And that's really a new feature, isn't it? That's, that's a colonial, that's a colonial, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A colonial uh, process, uh, a byproduct, I suppose, of getting beer to basically every corner of the planet. That really is modern history. Is that fair to say? We, we, even places like in Asia and say China or Japan or Korea, they wouldn't have seen beer necessarily, certainly not the beer that we consider today, the four main ingredients, water, um, water, malt, hops, and, and yeast. That's very, that sort of European identity of a beer that the, the reason why we see that everywhere today, that, that is a new feature, isn't it? It's, it's a, a colonial yeah. byproduct. Yeah, exactly. Right. From the last 500 years. So as I said, beer, as we know it, right, as a hoppy product originated in Europe and spread from there as the British colonized throughout the world, but also the Germans, you know, brought their beer tradition. So the, the beer that, you know, is brewed in Japan or in Brazil or all sorts of other places in the world um, is brewed you know, through the European tradition, right? Um, as German beer makers went there, uh, especially in the 19th century. And of course, the same thing with us in Canada, right? The, there were um, German and British beer makers who came here and, uh, and continued the tradition. Uh, what's nice that now though, is we're kind of in a new phase, right? Obviously kind of post-colonial phase maybe, um, and kind of back to, uh, what things were like in Neolithic times, right? As I said, in Neolithic times, people experimented. It was the period when people probably discovered beer as they somehow turned, you know, um, the starch and cereals to uh, maltose and fermented that. Um, but in Neolithic times, there was an enormous amount of experimentation with various foods, right? It's when people started to find 
uh, mushrooms that were edible versus the ones that could kill you and all kinds of other stuff. And uh, when it comes to beer making today, we seem to be back at that stage, right? The experimental stage, which is nice to see. So you have so many small um, breweries that try all sorts of different things that make beer uh, sometimes without hops, right? That add all sorts of strange ingredients like peanut butter or whatever, right? And are not constrained by the Reinheitsgebot, right? Which um, has those strict ingredients and so forth. Mm -hmm. those, those particular Germans and their, <laughs> their legislation from the 1500s. Yes, the right. Reinheitsgebot. Well, what do you think in terms of, maybe this is just a, an opinion question, Max, but are you, it sounds like you're not such a, a beer traditionalist. You're okay with experimentation. You don't think you're okay with calling a beer a beer if it adds in more ingredients than the than the quintessential four? Well, I'm fine with people enjoying whatever they like, right? <laughs> uh, um, uh, personally, I, I think that not all the experimentation works, right? Um, and there's a reason why, you know, in Germany, they their beer is really good. And, you know, they, they make it according to an old process and old recipes that stand the test of time. But of course, there's nothing wrong with experimenting and trying different things, right? Um, uh, for me, I mean, it's all a matter of taste. For me, I like the, the Belgian beers a lot, like the Trappist beers we've talked about that are uh, well balanced, high in alcohol, but you know, um, have a nice sweetness, but a bit of bitterness, not too much hoppiness. Uh, but it's a matter of personal taste, right? And uh, um, we're, like I said, I think going through an interesting experimental time, and we'll see what happens at the end of it, right? Uh, will we come up with some new styles that are going to be here to stay? right? Um, like extremely hoppy beers and quite sour beers seem to be popular right now. Are they a fad? Are they things that will stick around, right? Um, I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, these are all wonderful questions. If Because <laughs> fads, they seem to come and go pretty quickly in, in craft beer, but but there is a lot of tradition to draw from, which I think is fun. Would you, Max, another kind of personal question, if you, I don't know how much traveling you've done in Europe, if you had to go to a particular place knowing the phenomenal, profound and vast history of the entire continent and its connection to beer, is there a particular location that you would really have your sights on that you have been to or that you would like to go to that you are really interested in, in terms of the 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 origin story of beer as as what we know it today is there is there one maybe country you could narrow it down to a city would you really focus maybe on the trappist beer uh culture that exists maybe in more in northern in europe and belgium and the netherlands or or would you want to venture somewhere else to get a a grander taste of the history of beer um I, I guess, and here I'm biased, like I said, you know, my mother was born in Belgium and I like Belgian <laughs> yeah. beers. So again, uh, totally biased opinion, but, you know, I would say Belgium, Belgium is a great place. And, uh, uh, you know, we talked about the Trappist beers, but then you have the tradition, uh, two of the, the Lambics and Goose and so forth. Mm -hmm. And at some of the breweries, you can see uh, the spontaneous fermentation at work, right? So um, just outside of Brussels, uh, they um, there's a region where they uh, they grow cherries and they use those cherries in their kirik, right? Their um, beer, which is spontaneously fermented. So the beer is left out in huge troughs in uh, attics at some of the, you know, oldest traditional breweries um, and they allow the um, natural uh, yeasts in the air, right? Britannomyces and others to mm -hmm. um, ferment the beer and give it, uh, you know, a special taste 
Uh, they blend lambics to make beers. Um, it's all an amazing process if you go to some of those breweries and you get a sense of um, something like what beer making you know, was like hundreds of years ago. Um, uh, and of course, right beside that, you can see state-of-the-art facilities like Stella Artois, where they make um, mass-produced lagers, which actually taste quite good right at the brewery, right? And then you can, you know, right in the same afternoon, go to a monastery where you can't have a beer unless you have a sandwich because they don't want they, they don't want you to be drunk at the bar, right? So, for example, if you go to the monastery of Hoshpo, uh, one of the Trappist breweries, for every beer you order, you have to order a sandwich. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want you to linger around drinking too much of their high alcohol beer. So, you know, in one very small country that you can traverse in an afternoon, um, you can see all sorts of interesting different traditions. Um, from the ultra modern to, you know, the ancient monastic and uh, the uh, spontaneously fermented uh, with fruit beers, honey beers, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I think Belgium's so fascinating in, in terms of if you're looking at it as a, a beer loving country, which obviously it's, it's one of the most, because it is sort of two countries in one in a way, right? You have the, and I might butcher this here it's flanders and wallonia is that right that's right yeah yeah and they they're quite different aren't they like like their cultures are pretty different i think their their beer cultures are pretty different certainly maybe not so much anymore but looking at it historically it's uh well i think definitely... that's one thing they can agree on is uh, <laughs> yeah uh, is their beer um but yeah obviously you know the south wallonia was influenced by France, and uh, um, we don't normally think of France as a, a you know beer making country, but mm -hmm. a lot of great beers made in northern France. Um, and then the north uh, is obviously near the Netherlands, and uh, influenced more by Germany and so on. Um, so you have those influences, but you know the Belgians have their own unique um, uh, beer types that. Are neither French nor German or you know even Dutch or anything else, right? No, it is. It's its own identity, and it's hard to put your finger on it. Really, when people say, "Oh, I like Belgian style beer," it's like that's that's such a bold statement because it's they're really you they're kind of all over the place. And to really say, like you mentioned, lambics or or gozes or saisons i mean like they were such a a rainbow of, of different styles and flavors and interesting right i notes. didn't even mention the saisons which are yeah. quite um sour and the thing is more recently the belgians have been making um all sorts of other things like stouts as well which you basically would hardly hear of you know mm -hmm. in belgium um and british style beers and also make some making German style beers. I mean, there too, like everywhere else in the world, they're experimenting now, you know, with all sorts of stuff. I think it's really interesting to see these, these titans of beer, like the Netherlands or Belgium or Germany or Czech Republic, really how they're handling this American phenomenon of, of craft beer. I think it's really interesting. There's some seems to be some pushback in some regards but i mean it it's it's hard to stop it and and i think there is sort of this this mixture and, and it really does depend on where you are but an embrace for craft beer is kind of fun to see in lots of different places i think certainly in like the uk or ireland like it seems like craft beer is really prominent and it seems like it is kind of creeping its way, weaving its way into these really old traditional places, which it's kind of interesting. It's interesting to see the, the little bit of backlash, but also the acceptance, I think is kind of a fun, fun thing to watch from, from this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> I think that's true, right? And uh, as Canadians, I think 
our knee-jerk knee reaction is to say American beers are terrible, but mm -hmm. of course we're just talking about the big brewers, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there are thousands of great micro breweries and they've had an enormous influence. And I think you're right, there was resistance, especially at first, right, in the 80s, 90s, mm -hmm. um, to that kind of beer making in Europe, right, in Germany, that is kind of very insular or has been. They have their own beers, people, you know, in, in their town just drink their beer and so on. Uh, and the same thing with a, a lot of other countries, right, the Czech Republic and so on. But um, I think the floodgates have opened and you see all kinds of uh, American craft beers in Europe and obviously also European beers made, you know, the American way, mm -hmm. uh, very hoppy and so on. So, uh, you know, it used to be, I think in Germany, you you could barely find anything but German beers. But last time I was there, I could readily buy um, Belgian beers in Germany, which was once kind of unheard of, mm -hmm. uh, how, and American beers there. When I was in Copenhagen a few years ago, there, uh, there were pubs there that specialized just in American craft beers, right? There's one that um, was, um, they had the stone beers from California, yeah, right? They had maybe funny. 20 on tap or something. And this is in Denmark. <laughs> yeah. Um, and those are just a couple examples. You see that all over the place. So um, that's a new kind of influence, right? We talked about the influence from Europe outward throughout the whole world uh, in colonial times. Now it's you know, the, yeah, it's the other way, <laughs> the yeah. other way, right? Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Well, Max, I, we're coming up on our hour mark, so I want to be respectful of your time, but I just wanted maybe to end with a question: Is there any more research, another text, maybe on the way that that focuses or specializes in beer? And we're always interested in uh, uh, more pieces of academic or maybe more commercial work that's focused on beer and its history, particularly with European history. So anything in the works on the research or writing side? Well, I work on, on various things, not just beer. Uh, I don't have a, a book in the works, but um, I, I am uh, uh, working on an article about um, um, women and the uh, production of uh, beer. So wow. uh, traditionally, it's been said that um, beer was made by women in the household, right, in ancient times, um, and that men over time kind of took it over and professionalized beer making, such as the monks that we talked about, you know, in the Middle Ages. Uh, and so beer making went from being... Uh, home brewed by women to being, you know, professionally brewed by men outside of the home. Uh, and so that tends to be the narrative. Uh, but there is evidence in ancient Europe for professional female brewers. Um, and so it wasn't just men brewing professionally. Also, it wasn't just male monks who made beer. There were nuns in uh, medieval Europe who made beer as well. Um, and uh, there were men and women working together professionally, uh, making beer in Egypt, uh, for instance, in what is now France. So maybe the, the basic idea of going from, you know, home brewed to big, you know, professional brewed beer is correct, but the role of, of women in, in brewing hasn't maybe been completely um, studied carefully, right? Especially, the professional uh, women brewers or brewsters uh, from pre-medieval times, right? Um, so that's one thing I'm, I'm looking at right now. Professor Max Nelson in the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at the University of Windsor and author of The Barbarian's Beverage, A History of Beer in Ancient Europe. Max, thank you so much for joining. Look forward to chatting with you again soon. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer-related content. Remember, craft beer is here.